Okay, so we've got another lightning talk from Alexis Selia. Cool, hey. Um, so I'm Alexi, or Cloudhead, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the problem of peer-to-peer uh, -peer code collaboration and what we're doing at Monadic uh, around this. So um, I'd like to start with Git um, because I think this is today the foundation for code collaboration. It's the common ground. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, despite us using maybe GitLab, GitHub, uh, or mailing lists or whatever it is, uh, there's always um, at the center of that Git, at least for most people. Um, and if we want to talk about code collaboration, therefore, um, we should start with Git. Um, however, uh, there are a few things missing from Git as a protocol. Um, and this is why things like, like hosted platforms are so popular. Um, so I broke it down to three categories. There's discovery. So this is the problem of uh, finding change sets to merge or finding peers, uh, finding remotes, places to push to, things like that. Um, canonicity, which is to know which is the upstream that um, I should download my changes from or I should download a release from. Um, and social artifacts. So uh, Git, um, the bare bones Git only, su only supports code. Um, and if we want things like issues and, uh, and uh, pull requests or things like that, um, we need something extra. Um, so let's look at what has been done to, to resolve these. So first of all, we have mailing lists. So this is kind of the first solution uh, that there was. And um, uh, so it, it's, it's fairly simple in a way, um, but in terms of user experience and usability, it's not great. And so from there, we kind of moved towards um, uh, what I'm calling hosted platforms. And here we have our usability, and you know, it, it's, it's become really mainstream. Um, but uh, we have another problem, which is um, a lot of these are not free software. Um, they are not necessarily resilient in that uh, they are run by for-profit companies. Um, and they are, they're controlled in a way that does not allow communities to sort of um, stir them in the direction that is best for the community. So um, what does peer-to-peer -peer have to say about this? Is there, is there something we can do with peer-to-peer -peer technology um, that um, could fill this gap that Git, the protocol, um, has in terms of uh, code collaboration. Um, so first of all, just to, to, to explain why we would want to do this. So peer-to-peer um, -peer systems are resilient. And this is the most interesting thing about them. Um, they're economically resilient, uh, which means that they don't depend on making a profit. Uh, and this is simply because the burden is shared across the, the network and the community. So uh, typically, users host nodes, and therefore, um, we don't need to pay for hosting. Um, politically resilient, um, which is to say that um, there is no authority um, or, or country or government that can uh, shut down a peer-to-peer -peer network um, easily, uh, for everyone at least. And finally, technically resilient, uh, because there's no single point of failure, right? It's, it's quite hard to, to DDoS or to DOS uh, um, a peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, so before diving into, into uh, our solution, I want to talk about a, a, an example peer-to-peer -peer system that um, I really like uh, called Secure Scuttlebutt. And the reason I want to talk about this is that we're going to use, um, or we're going to um, take some inspiration from it um, for our code collaboration solution. Um, one of the coolest things about Scuttlebutt is this, um, what we call a social overlay protocol, which is that um, essentially, replication works based on your social network. So if you, um, in, in, in the center here, you have uh, the, the user um, in the pink circle, then you have a circle of friends and a circle of friends of friends. And everything within the, the two circles is replicated by the user in the middle, right? Everything out of the circle, so the dotted little, uh, little squares, are not replicated. So essentially, you choose what you replicate based on who you follow and you sort of, by proxy, choose um, friends of friends. And you also replicate those. And this has proved to work quite well, at least 
um, for the size of networks Scuttlebutt has. Um, another cool thing about this is that um, uh, you essentially um, uh, each, so identities are cryptographic, they use public keys, and um, therefore it's very easy to verify uh, if something is um, uh, legitimate by just verif verifying the signatures on the content. And we're, gonna, we're also gonna use this uh, property. Uh, cool. So what about code collaboration? So how do we, how do we sort of take these ideas, um, the, this kind of scuttlebutt ideas and the things we talked about, resilience, and how do we uh, uh, get to a code collaboration solution? So our project is called Radical. Um, and uh, Radical is essentially Git plus peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a few kind of properties it has that I'm gonna introduce quickly. Um, of course, it's offline first, so it, it keeps that property that Git already has. Um, it's secure um, in the same way Scuttlebutt is secure in that it, it's all based on uh, cryptographic identities, and so everything is signed. Every single object in a network is signed by someone. Um, and, of course, it's peer-to-peer -peer, um, in the sense that um, you don't really need a server, although in some cases we'll see it could be useful, but um, it's not required. Um, and the, the design is based on three technologies which um, we kind of take our inspiration from. Um, so Scuttlebutt I, I just talked about, um, where, where we, we take the, um, the follow graph, but instead of a social network, we use a network of, um, of clones, essentially, of, of, uh, of repositories and their remotes. Um, there's Tuff, the update framework, which um, maybe some people know about, um, which uh, is, a, is a way to sort of uh, authoritatively um, update a set of maintainers, for example, um, or a set of metadata around a project, um, even under, under attack, like a stolen key and, and things like that. And finally, Git, which I already talked about, um, which Radical is, is uh, really based on. So why, why, why Git? So of course, um, you know, as, as a, we talked about it as a common ground for uh, source code collaboration, but it's actually cool for peer-to-peer -peer in even more ways, right? Um, so for one, it, it's optimized for full replication. So this is great for peer-to-peer for -peer offline first systems. Um, second, it's designed for the bizarre model. And it turns out the bizarre model um, where there's no real um, you know, kind of uh, central server you push to, um, works really well for peer-to-peer -peer where there typically isn't a central server either. So this works really well for us. Um, finally, pack files. Pack files are really, really cool. Um, and it's one of the reasons why um, certain sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks um, didn't work for us, uh, like IPFS, and I can talk more about this after the presentation, um, because pack files is an interactive protocol which makes uh, replication super, super fast. Um, and most of you know about it, so I'm not gonna go into it. Um, cool, so let's talk about the, the architecture of Radical quickly. Um, we don't have that much time, but I think just kind of um, going briefly into it. So each user essentially um, is this, uh, this yellow sort of square, and um, each user runs two or has two es essentially copies, which are not really copies, they're hard link, but they're, they're, they're two logical copies of the repository. There's one working tree which is the, uh, the a working copy, which is the one you kind of edit and commit, and this is what you use day to day. And there's a hidden replicated copy, which is what's being replicated to the other peers, right? And so from the working copy standpoint, it looks like typical, you know, if you use GitHub or whatever. But in the replicated copy, we have other things. So um, <coughs> we have, for instance, um, remotes of remotes. So as, you, as I don't know if you can read it, but you can essentially um, we, we store two degrees out um, of all of our remotes. And um, there's some other sort of hidden branches um, which give metadata around the project. Um, so the concept of a project is just kind of like a set of repositories uh, that all have the intent to be one thing, one logical thing. And a contributor, and this is the information on the specific clone or specific um, tree, essentially, that, that um, you have uh, on your computer. Um, and so the, 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 the purple, um, the, the replicated copies sort of replicate amongst each other, other, and the user pushes locally, essentially it's like a, it's a file protocol push, so it's instant. Um, 
but the, the git push is when you want to publish, when you want to make something public, essentially. Um, before that, it's just kind of your own, uh, your own copy. Um, and so diving a little bit into the, you know, what, what is this idea of, of project and why do we use Tuff and things like that. Um, so this is kind of a mock um, a view of, of this, this project file. And so it's, it's essentially in a disjoint branch, right? It's in a branch that is hidden. And you have, of course, like project name. But the most important thing is you have a list of maintainers, right? And these are public keys. And updating this list of maintainers requires essentially a signature from a, a quorum of maintainers. So um, you can essentially verify this when you clone a project. You can verify that the code is essentially approved by the maintainers in some way. And the way this works is that this initial project file, which has the, the initial list of maintainers, is hashed, um, or it's, it's committed, and the, the, um, the commit hash becomes a project ID, right? And so that's what you share. And so when you receive a, uh, when you clone a project, you have the project ID, you verify the, the, um, the pro project metadata file, and you verify, you, you sort of go through the history of that file, which is again in its own branch, um, and verify each step, making sure there's a quorum of signatures if there are updates, like adding a maintainer, removing a maintainer, and, and so forth. And then each clone, so, so there's, there's one of these project files for the, for the entire uh, project, for the, for, uh, yeah. And there's one of these contributor files for each clone in that project, right? So each person will have their own contributor file, which has their signing key, and which also has refs that are signed by that signing key. So this is kind of the, the counterpart to that, which says that um, I, as a contributor or maintainer, right, um, am signing this reference saying um, I approve of this. This is a legitimate change, right? And so in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you can sort of attest that things are um, uh, authoritative, basically, and, and you make sure that someone hasn't just, you know, cloned a cloned a project, um, changed the maintainers, and then signed a bunch of refs, and you have no idea if this is still something uh, you want to build and, and use, essentially. Um, in terms of replication, I'm not going to go into <laughs> lots of details either. Um, but you know, essentially, um, we're, we're building a, a gossip-based protocol where um, when you have a new uh, ref for something, uh, you just announce it to your connected peers. Uh, you say, hey, here's for this project ID, here's a new ref, and here's a hash of that ref, right? And then um, uh, the, a, a peer will just fetch, and they will fetch through the Git protocol because that's what's super fast. Um, fetch the ref, of course, they do all the validation then. If it's the first time they see your project, they will go through the whole uh, project metadata first without even having to clone the source code. And that's one of the cool things is that having um, source code in one branch and having metadata and, and the other things in other branches, you can sort of do a shallow clone and just kind of verify the, the authenticity of the project before you download the whole source code. Um, yeah, and by the way, for, I'm not talking about like how we do issues and, and, and PRs and that kind of thing um, here, but it's the same principle. So um, there's, there's going to be hidden branches uh, with issues, with revisions, and so you could also you know, maybe you're just interested in issues and you don't want to download the whole source code because you're a user who is not a developer and you just want to create an issue, right? So um, these will work kind of in the same way. Um, and that's about it. Um, you can find out more information on the website. Uh, it's, it's still in heavy development, um, but um, there's, there's more info there. So we've got a minute for questions, if I could just. Is there a way to revoke a maintainer if somebody goes rogue and starts putting malicious changes in? Yes. Uh, so is there a way to revoke a maintainer? Yes. Um, again, it depends on kind of the, the quorum and the, and the rules of your, of your project metadata file. But essentially, um, if it's two out, like two out of three, for example, and you want to remove one maintainer, you need two signatures, and then, of course, the the person downloading the project will verify that that was legitimately removed, that maintainer was legitimately removed. Yeah. How secure is Radical? Sorry? How secure is Radical? How secure is Radical? Yes. Uh, that's a complicated question. Um, so as secure as can be. 
Um, so we're, we're building it, we're designing it in a way that um, we're using everything available to make it as secure as possible. And as I said, like everything is, is signed and um, can be verified and attested, essentially. Okay, awesome, thank you very much.